We thank you, O gracious Heavenly Father, for gathering us together that we can study uh, primarily the thoughts of T.F. Torrance and his influence in this society. We pray that uh, through the uh, work of Ross that we may gain deeper understanding from a different perspective and how we can apply the insights of theology and science and its relationship in this world today. We thank you and pray for your blessing in this hour, this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for that. So we welcome today Ross Hastings from beautiful British Columbia Regent College, living in the sunshine today, which is not always the case. So we, we celebrate these days where the sun shines through the windows and all is well. We are continuing our conversation. We're doing two things today. One is we're going to look at the chapter that Ross wrote in this book relatively briefly. And then Ross is also going to talk to us some about in the book that is going to be coming out at some point in the future, unknown at this point, because there's this thing called publishers. And you just never know when things are going to meet the final goal and be out and ready. But you do have a cover and a few things like that. So that is great. How long have you been at Regent now, Ross? 18 years. 18 years. So one of the senior members of the faculty there, and you have the distinguished place of being both a scientist and a theologian, and those are a rare breed. And so we're grateful for what you bring to that and to recognize T.F. Torrance as somebody who has been influential for you. And did you work with Alan Torrance for your doctor? Is that right? I did, yes. Um, so I would say we are theological cousins, at least, if not brothers. Yeah. Because I went to I New was, Zealand for that task. I was about 50 when I took my my PhD, my second PhD in, in, in theology with Alan. And uh, I got on with him like a house on fire because we loved two things, rugby and Karl Barth. <laughs> okay. And that is good. Those are good. Those are good points to engage. Yeah. So the, uh, the your background in the science part, what was your study in the scientific part of your study about? Yeah. So I was uh, my, my first PhD is in organometallic chemistry. Organometallic chemistry is the the chemistry of carbon compounds with transition metals like iron, ruthenium, cobalt, nickel, they tend to be very uh, good catalysts for the chemical industry. Um, so I worked for uh, three and a half years, my PhD with Michael Baird at, at Queens in Kingston, Ontario. And um, at that time, uh, there was an interest in researching how do you get from coal to uh, hydrocarbons. Mm. And uh, the Germans during the First and Second World War had a process called fischer tropsch catalysis, where if you take coal and you steam treat it, you generate carbon monoxide and hydrogen. If you pass that over cobalt or nickel or iron catalysts, it generates the whole range of hydrocarbons. So they, they never required dependence on Arab oil during the, 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 the two world wars. Mm. South Africa oh. today is probably the world's leading expert in fischer tropsch catalysis. They're, all of their petrol, petroleum also comes from this fischer tropsch process. So I was involved in an aspect of that. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, there are people like James Clerk Maxwell, where his theology informed the nature of his discovery of electromagnetic fields. Um, there are others who see things in metaphors. T.F. Torrance loved light as a metaphor for understanding the nature of theology. Have you found that your scientific training gave you a lens, a unique lens, to be able to read theology in a way that others might not? Yes, I think so. But I had not been to Regent when I studied my with my PhD. Had I yeah. first gone to Regent and then done my PhD, I might have done a better job of integration. Um, but there never, nevertheless, there were uh, there, there there was always a sense for me of the order. Uh, the mm. taxes of the universe mm. oriented around the periodic table. How How is it that, first of all, we have the capacity um, to write a periodic table and to see that all the elements of the cosmos can be arranged according to that proton number. And uh, 
and, and know that chemistry is really a bonding, the bonding of those things. Um, so I had some sense of that. Yeah. But a deeper sense of it came as I began to engage science and theology once I was a regent professor. We had a couple of uh, Templeton grants that we won, and that forced me to actually really engage the topic. Mm. And uh, this this chapter I've written in the book, um, by the way, it led to a book on its own called Echoes of Coherence. And so if you do desire to, to, to read more on that, you can look at uh, Echoes of Coherence, which was published by Cascades. And in that book, I really looked to T.F. Torrance for justification of the legitimacy and the value of an incarnational and therefore trinitarianly co coherent model for holding theology and science together. Mm. So this chapter and that book are really, that's that's the nub of it. That's the core of it. Yeah. And you wrote this chapter first and then that book? I did. Um, and I kind of... Uh, as I've been reading through this chapter in preparation for today, I realized there are quite a few things in this that I wish I'd put in the book. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless. Um, well, that's okay. Well, we want to hear what that is. So yeah, the word for coherence, sure. just for those. And again, we're recording this, so others will be able to listen later. So I always try and be aware of the broader audience that will ultimately be able to hear this. So the word coherence is not what everybody uses every day in their kitchen table conversation. So can you give a brief insight as to how somebody might think about coherence as a way that connects with understanding theology and science? You know, interestingly, I, I will come to that in just a second. Interesting, when I wrote my first book, it was called Missional God, Missional Church, Hope for Re-Evangelizing the West. Yeah. Um, I had been through a number of edits, and when the final edit came, I was kind of fed up with editing, and I was just going to return it and say, it's fine. And I decided to look up one word coherence and the final editor had replaced every coherence with the word every item every uh, occurrence of the word coherence with the word coherence ah it would have absolutely trashed the book i was so glad i did the final edit yeah coherence in some ways is very parallel to the word perichoresis and it has the idea that of, of two entities, each is in the other, yet each is not the other. I think that's an important... Uh, so this is true. The word was first used actually for the hypostatic union, not of the Trinity, but first of the hypostatic union. Of, of, of the hypostatic union. Gregory of Nazianzus uses the term to describe the relationship between the two natures of Christ. John of Damascus later on uses, uses it again for the for the incarnation it's maximus really um who brings the term into trinitarian uh mm. usage and um and so it's it's the idea um sim simply the idea that uh each is in the other but each is not the other mm. um there is uh one of the interesting things um that I discovered when I was researching uh, TF, TF on this matter of science is to, to find that the person who uses and defines coherence best in all of his books, I think, is a scientist. And his name is Jim Neidhart. And uh, he, he talks about coherence being used of the incarnation and then also the three persons of the Trinity. And then he goes on to talk about concepts and science as being coherent. Um, and uh, so I, I just wanted to find this quote by by uh, Jim Neidhart himself. Which book uh, is that that you're referring to? Uh, Ground the Grammar. But, um, and, and so we find... Uh, yeah, let me. Just, I just can't seem to put my hand. It's it's in your it's in the chapter, and uh, yep. it's basically the idea of um, oh here it is the the word indicates a sort of dynamic mutual containing or mutual involution of realities, uh, which is often spoken of as coherence. Mm. Uh, the thing I would want to really emphasize. I received some critique for using the term coherence for theology and science for a number of reasons. 
but I think some people are critique it without understanding what coherence is. Yeah. So you so you have these four ways of looking at theology and science: the conflict model, the overlapping magisteria model or independence, the dialogue model or bridge building, uh, and then integration models, of which I think Torrance is 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 profoundly. Uh, I, I think Tom Torrance adds huge amount to the discussion by using the concept of coherence mm. and talks about the profound mutuality, profound mutuality of theology and science, not just of their histories, but of their epistemology and of their ontology. Yeah. And th those, those are the main points. Um, but what I would wish to emphasize, as indeed he emphasized, is that coherence is not emerging, just as it's not emerging together just as in uh, the great Chalcedonian statement, the two natures of Christ are without confusion, without mixing. So theology and science cannot be mixed. They are separate, uh, wonderful guilds. And science does not need theologians to tell them how to do science. And theologians don't need scientists to tell them how to do theology. How to do, how to do theology. Um, and yet there is a profound mutuality, which, if explored, brings uh, all kinds of enrichment on both sides um, of the fence. Um, so, for example, for uh, for Tom Torrance, he believed that um, theologians needed to pay attention to scientific method uh, by way of keeping them honest about their reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, Alistair McGrath says, yes, science, on the other hand, desperately needs theology. Mm -hmm. You know, my fear, and this comes from my experience in the science world, is that so many, particularly PhD students and then professors sometimes too, are very much engaged in the technology of science and all of the te technocratic things that are involved in science um, without thinking about the meaning of what they're doing. Science needs theology because Theology adds meaning to science, I think, in very, very yeah. in, enriching ways. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of TFT, Torrance. Some point in this article, I say we need to move on from TFT to Christ, but really, Christ, <laughs> Christ is the it's center of TFT, yeah. um, and I'm, 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 it's utterly remarkable that T.F. Torrance actually uh, was not a scientist. And yet he receives an honorary doctorate at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, and the principal of the university compares him to Einstein. Um, this is utterly remarkable because he it had such a question of what time. is a scientist, though, doesn't it? What's that? It raises the question of what is a scientist? Yes, yes. And of and course, what is the realm of science i mean at one level yeah. to say i'm agreeing with what you're saying but in my head i'm also going but there's this other dimension that that tf pointed towards and that's what i call the science of the personal the yes. nature of science by definition deals with the world as object even psychology at some level objectifies the human and so there to say theology is a science is to say that its object is the nature of the person of, of the persons of who is god and how do we do the science of who we are from that perspective in such a way that we gain insight, we indwell and have a capacity to do scientific investigation beyond what merely seeing them as an object is. So the, the keeping honest part, I think that's really important. And I'm going to be spending a month with Carrie this summer. One of the things I'm looking at is a book on the science of the personal and just the question how yeah. within the history of science can we say, it's a half truth to only see the world as object because as Polanyi said it's persons who are doing the investigation and the nature of what it means to hold scientific beliefs in community is a it's a faith commitment so to say that there there is something more than shared there there is the investigative process i think that tf torrance really brings yeah um i think they don't there's... just bump up against each other do they yeah, no, I think there's two uh, two things I'd like to say in response to what you've just said. I think first of all, uh, and 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 TF anticipated this um, when he uh, there was there was a fear of, amongst theologians that all of a sudden science becomes the major narrative under which all theology must sit. That's not what he yeah. meant. 
No. Um, the, he calls that the Scientia Universalis. Um, but rather that each science, and this is a key phrase for Torrance, each science uh, has to be developed catafusin. So mm -hmm. catafusin is um, in strict conformity to the nature of the object. Yep. Um, and so, so for theology, uh, the object is the incarnation, is the revealed God in Jesus Christ. The object and how the, is the subject. How the, church, yeah, how the church moves from that to the Trinity uh, is a scientific process for, for, for Tom Torrance, in the sense that you know, John says that which we have seen, which we have heard with our eyes, that's, that's empiricism. The, the apostles had, had uh, seen Jesus, had touched Jesus. All of those things were part of a scientific process of moving towards ultimately... Uh, the epistemology is very similar with science um, and uh, theology in that regard. Yeah. With regard to personhood, I mean, the same, the same principle applies. It's according to the nature of the object. Yes. And studying personhood, I think, is much more complex than studying an atom. It's um, very for complex. All, for all kinds of reasons, including the fact that our personhood um, is at least an analogy of divine personhood. Uh, so there, there is mystery, um, but but the science, if you like, of say theological anthropology, if we may call it that, uh, I think ultimately must be done catafusion, beginning with who is Christ, who is yeah. who is who is the bridge between human personhood and divine personhood. Yep. You know, some theologians want to say there is there is no link. We've got to be very careful with links. To which I add, the link is Jesus Christ. Right, who is in fact a human, a divine human person, yep. um, and that personhood must inform both divine personhood and also our human personhood. But the same principle, I think, of catafusion is 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 so important uh, in that regard. In the book that you wrote this essay in is T. F. Torrance and Evangelical Theology, and I think that you're you're bumping right up against the answer to the question: Why is your article? about T.F. Torrance and science in a book for evangelical theology. So there's an interface with a particular group. Do you want to speak to that? I, I, can you say more? I'm not quite sure where you're coming well, from. Well, the that. nature of T.F. Torrance and evangelical theology is, yeah. I mean, with Karl Barth, I have half, I have about 12 books on, on Karl Barth and evangelical theology. This is the first book on T.F. Torrance and evangelical theology. And so the uh -huh. reason this book exists is because evangelical theology has its own particular resistances and its potential engagements. And so Mike Hobbits, I think, gathered a collection of people like you and I to really build those bridges and say, if you really understand T.F. Torrance's work, it enriches the evangelical world. And so you were invited to be somebody, I think, to say there's something that evangelicals have as a possibility that most of them haven't heard of T.F. Torrance, but were yeah. they to understand him, there would be a bridge to something that would be better for a competent kind of evangelical thinking. Wow. I think the first challenge is when we use the word evangelical and we're thinking of a group of people in North America or Britain or all over the world, yep. I don't think that's the way in which Bart or Torrance thought of the word evangelical. For them, it was of the gospel. Um, and, you know, the fact that God is for humanity, uh, the fact that the incarnation has implications for the world, at least in terms of provision of atonement and so on. Um, and with regard to, you know, with regard to the whole science discussion, um, there, I don't know if you had this piece, piece in, the, in, the, in the part that you were given, there is a comment on how uh, Alan Torrance actually speaks with evangelical fervor to his class um, about the uh, oh, you know, all kinds of things, but particularly this this theology science narrative, yes, um, and 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 the fact that they are not in conflict. Um, one of his favorite sayings is the ordo cognoscendi is only possible in, on account of the ordo ascendi. In other words, the, the goodness of God inherent in creation is what science has the privilege of uncovering. Mm. Um, to look at it that way 
um, and then to see all, all, you know, all, all the ways in which God has graced humanity to discover science. Yeah. Um, I think of this in the realm of common grace. Um, but the fact that you know, scientists can uncover the remarkable nature of the universe um, is indeed, I think, a sign of God's grace. We are engraced as, as, as anthropos. Um, and as such, um, this is an evidence of the evangelical nature of God, the goodness of God, the, the, the fact that uh, God has in the gospel uh, you know, revealed himself in the person of Jesus, uh, who is the revealed God, the self-revealed God. Yeah. And there is also a sense in which the nature, the nature of the ability of science to be servants or caregivers is in a sense something within which we would say a good theology recognizes the nature of the role that we have as God is the creator, we are the creatures, and this creation that we live within is something that God created, and there is a mutual mutuality of caring that can also exist there, which ties into Eric's work probably. Um, the whole nature of what James Ammon did, did at Duke on his Doctor of Ministry is helping pastors to recognize being in the places they live and to care for those as a theological agenda. So there you have science being given as tools to pastors to think about not just how do I get people into this building, but how do I engage a community of people in caring for the place we live together as an outworking of God's call in our lives. So I there think you've if, got a working together. Yeah, I think if pastors had an understanding of the critical realism that Tom Torrance speaks about, both in theology and in science, it would be a huge bridging of the gap. I think it's yeah. a really, really important dimension is realism, uh, that's critical realism. Um, so yeah, that, that I think is the first. And you're going to write that book, right? What's that? You're going to write that book, right? Which book? The book for pastors on critical. Oh, realism. Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe you and Eric can write that book together. Yeah. Stan Grant oh. was good at writing books with people. So Ross also related here. to your comment, um, is, in, in my book and in, and indeed in this chapter, you'll find a reference to scientists as priests of creation. Mm. Um, this relates to the Imago Dei. We, you know, uh, one of the ways of putting together, I, see, I'll confess, when I was a scientist, I did not have a good sense of the meaning of what I was doing. I was just frustrating. I wanted to get the results and get out of the lab. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes you'd spend a week preparing a compound and you'd drop the flask on Friday. Uh, your whole week had been wasted, right? That's the, that's yeah. part, that's part of the terribly terribly difficult job of being a scientist. Um, and they're alone most of the time. Had I had somebody, if somebody had said to me in the midst of my career as a chemist, do you, Ross, do you realize that you're a priest of God's creation, giving creation a voice? Well, that would have made a big difference. So, if you could take a young scientist right now and give them that talk, what what would you say to them, recognizing they probably don't have the theological tools to get that? Yeah, yeah. But that they require somebody like you. What would you say to somebody to help them to get that point? I would definitely start with the image of God um, and God's intention um, for humans to steward creation well, and in, in stewarding creation well, they need to understand it. I would talk to them about the fact that Colin Gunton used to say that creation was good, but it wasn't perfect. Hmm. And on the sixth, and on the sixth day, God hands the baton over to humanity and says, you finish it. And of course, that can't be finished until the sun shows up as the last atom. But yeah. um, in a sort of secondary sense, we as humans carry on the work of creation and we are meant to look after it. And for scientists to get a sense of that, um, and understand, uh, understand, therefore, the important role that they have as priests of creation be very important. I mean, it, it's quite it's quite interesting that chapter four of Genesis makes reference to a scientist mm. and an artist. When um, the sons the sons of Seth, I think it is, are outlined, and one is Jubal, and Jubal had a band. I worship. He had a band. Okay. Um, the first the first artist in God's creation. And then it talks about those that were workers of metal, mm. metallurgists, chemists, in other words. Um, right. So you get this idea, even in the book of Genesis, a, a hint towards 
arts and sciences in a way that I think uh, would be interesting for a young scientist to hear. Um, yeah. And I, I think, you know, then as they grow, I would try to point out that the way in which they reason and arrive at results is very similar to how uh, a biblical scholar would come at reason, uh, would use reason to discover proper exegesis of a passage, how, a, how theology in the life of the church um, was also empirical in that sense, and to give them a sense that, that it's not Sunday and then Monday to Friday and a dualism. There's one thing T.F. Tarns disliked, it was dualism. Um, uh, he did not like dualism, and we have to cure, it seems to me we have to cure our young scientists of that precise dualism, where they come Sundays, and many of them can barely get through the sermon because they sense in their pastor a complete lack of scientific awareness, yeah. um, and 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 then go back into the world that they, they can value and understand. Um, so, yeah, um, I'd like to write another book, but yeah. In, in all, in all Another honesty, thing my... on your point is, do we call Jesus a carpenter? But my blacksmith friend says, you know, the word in the Greek there is technon, which means he had to make the nails. He had to make all of the tools that were used in building houses. He had to be able to do the technology of all that went into it, which the word scientist says you've just appropriately put out there, could easily yeah. apply to Jesus in the role that he played in his hometown there. You know, I think one really important point in this bridge between theology and science, as I said, is critical realism. Um, it, it's the idea that epistemology is grounded in ontology. Now, we know that as theologians, that our epistemology, how we know God as the triune God, is grounded in the ontology of who Jesus Christ is and was and revealed himself to be. Um, and similarly, you know, for scientists, um, there is this, this uh, probably a, an implicit understanding that doesn't really become explicit, explicit, that what they are discovering about whatever they're studying, um, that what they know about it is grounded in what it really is. Because mm. if it weren't the case, God would be, I think we could call God um, capricious. Um, this is the amazing reality that, that God has given to scientists a capacity to test things. So in chemistry, for example, you create a new compound. What, how do you know you've created that compound? Um, you, you do an infrared spectrum, then you do a mass spectrum, and then you do an X-ray crystallography, all of those things. They are objective means of trying to arrive at what it is you've done. Yeah. But when you've reached your conclusion that this is, say, Di, 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 dodecaruthenium carbonyl, for example, the, I want to snow you with, with words here, but uh, um, we hope that the X-ray crystallography, which is actually a picture, in a sense, of that molecule, corresponds to what really is there. Right. And I think that is, a, that is quite a remarkable thing, mm. that um, epistemology follows ontology. If it weren't the case, we wouldn't have science. Yeah. We would have the question so of why it matters also is that implicit within a scientist also it's going to matter that i know what this is because yeah, of what yeah. it could be used for or um, to distinguish it from other things that look like it so does why it matters live in the in the thinking of a scientist as well i i think one of the frustrations of scientists is that they have pervasive sense that this doesn't matter Hmm. Particularly when you when you're doing work on an erudite kind of area of chemistry, and you go home to your wife and or spouse, and you ask, she asks, "What did you do today? Can you help me understand what you did today?" And it's almost impossible. Uh, often, if a person doesn't have any you know, any background in science, yeah. um, so I think there is a temptation for scientists to think oh, what I'm doing doesn't matter. But I think a positive view. Uh, of science would lead me to, to, to say, in my pursuit of what I'm researching, am I being responsible? You don't have, a, you can have, can't afford not to ask this question. Am I responsible for what I'm making? And will this enhance the goodness of creation, mm. creation care? Um, or is it is it going to further 
damage the creation. In other words, you, I think as a, a Christian seeking to be fully human, living out the image of God, you have to ask those questions. Yeah. Um, what will this do for, for nature? What will this do for, for God's good creation? Um, and ultimately, of course, though, it's like First Peter telling people who work or as slaves to, to work as unto God, as unto the Lord. Ultimately, as scientists who lives most of their lives in private places with deep questions that maybe even your supervisor doesn't understand. Um, if, you, if you don't have an orientation towards God that says, God, I'm doing this as unto the Lord. Um, I'm participating with God's work in the world and doing this uh, in yeah. union with the living Christ who is the last Adam. You know, th yeah. th that's that's an important dimension, I think, of the life of a scientist. Yeah. Sometimes I find we have to teach people new uses of old words. Um, when I do counseling, sometimes I I had yeah. a couple who neither of them are Christians. And one of them said, you know, I know you're I know you're a Christian, but I really don't want to do any theological talk. And I said, right. That's fine. And so I started <laughs> by saying, how, how would you define the difference between a person and an individual? And I had him write it down and we talked about it. And I said, well, in our conversations, an individual is who you are separate from others. It's your thoughts, feelings separate from others. And for the word person, we're going to talk about who you are in relationship to others. Now, I didn't tell him. Now, this one comes from the Trinity and this one comes from <laughs> Western Newtonian thought because he didn't need to get all that. But yeah. they bought onto it in about an hour. And he said, this is what I've been looking for. And it's like, yeah, you just don't know the the reality of theology to begin to open up how we get it, what's really important. But I had to teach them to use those words for distinction in a kind of a scientific way so that our language as scientists can help distinguish and find why it matters for then pursuing further investigation. So that is, a, I think, a definite help in the, in the science of the personal that, that can be there. And I think it's also true when people look out at the world, I mean, this is the creation care. James Torrance said, you know, I came to Washington State and I would go into the forest and there was this sign, uh, Department of Natural Resources, land of many uses. He said, what's that saying to us? Yeah. It says yeah. it's all for us to use. There's no sense of the value and dignity of the yes. land in and of itself. It, and that yeah. was a wonderful distinguishing for me of just beginning to get a sense how we rethink about the nature of the care of the land yeah yeah just reading the signs and going what's implicit there i love it in vermont where they say wear your belt seat belt it's common sense but it's like if you studied theology you know the common sense defaults to the human in ways that torrance and bart are going to say that's just natural theology and it's your common sense is not that common and a lot of it doesn't make sense yeah. Right. And this is where science for many people they think is common sense, but it really requires a high level of understanding, katafusen, in a way where you really come to understand the nature of all those things. And to say that for Torrance, as you keep you know highlighting appropriately, Christological foundations is the place to get the ground of our grammar, the meaning of these things, so that we can go go beyond that into an understanding of the one who creates it all and then the outworking of all that that has been made yes indeed so the nature of michael polanyi how much work did you do with michael polanyi in your work oh a fair bit a fair bit there, there are sections in this even in this chapter that refer to even his in work this chapter yes so what do you think michael polanyi because he he like you was a true scientist before he came to the world of theological yeah, thinking yeah, yeah absolutely so can you just say what you what you learned with him in kind of the sense of seeing his own development to recognize that science has great value with an engagement with theology, there's a greater value to be gained? Well, it just seems to me that people like T.F. Torrance, Alistair McGrath, and others who've been leading the area, leading this area of, of the um, discussion uh, about theology and science all borrow from him in some ways, yeah. particularly with respect to um, to post-critical philosophy, uh, his his uh, his wanting to avoid a dualism of knowledge and faith, recognizing that knowledge is faith, mm -hmm. 
Uh, that's an important dimension uh, that everyone, I think, uh, borrows from in that sense. Um, I think uh, the personal nature of knowledge mm. uh, is, a, is, a, is a, a significant di di dimension of his work as well. Um, and you know, very much, I think, his uh, the whole um, epistemology, ontology discussion uh, yeah. is important for him as well. And he yeah. is kind of defined as a person of critical realism over against logical positivism. Right. That uh, interestingly, no, almost nobody in science these days is a logical positivist anymore. anymore, anymore. Um, so critical realism is the order of the day. Yeah, so those are some important some important aspects. So you you're saying across the across the scientific world, critical realism is the norm. I think it's ad increasingly admitted to be the norm of how we know. And that's part. My question is partly in regards to what has been for the last few decades a question around postmodernism that everyone has their own truth, which is clearly not critical yeah. realism, and the question about the culture and its capability to think scientifically if it still believes that everyone has their own truth that they're not working from that so how does the world of science how has it separated from or how is it serving is it bringing back people to a critical realist way of thinking i think the challenge is the word postmodern is so wide in its meaning yeah. and there's so many postmodern philosophers and theologians I mean, there's an aspect of postmodernity that I think is very consonant with critical realism, very consonant with, you know, critiquing the idea that, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the idea of pure reason, it doesn't exist. And I think postmodernity, I mean, some of its forms have ex has exposed that to which we say, thank you very much. We've been saying that since Augustine, you know, so um, that's, that's, that's one aspect of things. Um but then, of course, there are the more nihilist kind of ways of thinking about postmodernity, where there is no fact, there is no no sense of of, of grounded knowledge. And um, yeah, I think yeah, T. F. Torrance is, I think, very very aware of of that that other side of things. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think he's, he's one of the things that I admire about Torrance is he's so careful. So, for example. Um, you know, there's two sides to his argument, which I think is epistemology, which is grounded in ontology, and then there's an ontological similarity between theology and science related to certain realities that are part of theology. And he, he uh, wants to be quickly saying, uh, when I'm talking about these kinds of vestigia, I am not talking about three-leaf clovers, mm -hmm. you know. I'm, uh, I, I sometimes get critiqued at Regent or, or made fun of because Somebody will stand up and say there are three points to my talk today, and happy, and Ross will be happy because it's a Trinitarian talk. Absolute right. nonsense. That's not Trinity. That's that's uh, that's right. truthy. That's truthyism, uh, yeah. not Trinity at all. But anyway, the point is, um, you know, when he when he's clarifying, and the rest of this chapter that you haven't had a chance to read, some of you is really an outline of phenomenological categories in God that enable us uh, to put together science and theology. Uh, so things like order, things like plenitude, things like agency, divine freedom reflected in creational freedom, such that the, the creation is profoundly dependent upon Christ and the Spirit, and yet it has its own particular freedom, so much so kind of relating to my next uh, subject matter here on this call, chemical evolution and divine providence, um, creation seems to be able to participate in its own development. Hmm. Um, so, so those kind of phenomenological categories, that's what he means by an ontol ontological similarity between science and theology. Um, and that's, uh, and, and of course, he's able to go there in ways that Bart isn't. You know, so for, for Bart, um, he wants to begin with divine revelation in Jesus Christ, uh, but never move towards the creation in terms of engaging with it. Whereas Tom, we're so thankful that Tom went further and said, actually, there is a form of natural theology which is legitimate, 
Number one, it comes under revealed theology. Um, and there are other ways in which she qualified it. It must begin with divine revelation um, and and so on. So yeah. yeah, those are just a few thoughts on that regard. I, I think that Bart did, he opened the door for that kind of theology of nature that wasn't natural theology. It's a yeah. question of ordering, right? So there are several places that as I'm working through the dogmatics where I say, okay, Bart really did open it. He just said, that's not my task. But he didn't close it as a door for the work of even psychology as well as the, the hard sciences, the natural sciences. So I, I do think that Torrance took it beyond, but he was encouraged in a sense to do that even by yeah, Tom Torrance does comment on the fact that when he told Bart what he was doing, Bart smiled. Um, you know, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, at Bart, it's funny, at Bart, I believe Tom Torrance gets from Bart the idea um, of what I was saying earlier about the uh, the whole idea of according to the subject, according to the object. That um, Bart is in a conversation one day with Schultz, who's a somebody in, in his academic area, and Schultz says there are five qualifications for something to be a science. And um, theology fails. And uh, Bart responds by saying, there is only one criteria for a thing to be a science, understood as scientia, knowledge. And that is, do we study it according to, um, according to its object, according to its object? Um, and, that's, and, that, and that I think is picked up by Torrance. It's interesting in my work on providence and chemical evolution, I have uh, I have opted for Bart's view of providence, even though Bart had no interest in science. His um, theology of providence is very much in keeping with um, is, I th is I think that which gives gives the greatest freedom mm -hmm. for creation to be engaged uh, and participating in its own development. Yeah, accompanying and giving it the space to be what it is. That's the one, yeah. Concursus. Are you, are you familiar with Harold P. Nebelsack's book, Theology and Science in Mutual Modification? No, I'm not. It's one Be of five Be books that T.F. Torrance edited. He gathered five mm -hmm. books that were part of a series on um, science, science. Let's see, what is it? The, the book Christian Theology and Scientific Culture was the first of those five books. Oh, yes, and this, and this is the second of those five books. So T.F. Torrance does the the leading on. I've just finished going through the twelve that he did later in the eighties. Um, right. Science of the, uh, theology and science: the frontiers of knowledge. So some of these themes come up in these places. In this particular book, he really takes Bart as a, a significant person in the the mutuality of theology and science and what it's doing. And of course, T.F. Torrance yes. gathers these people to write these books. So. Again, yes. it's a community that's developing, and the right. opening the opening statement in the dogmatics, Christian dogmatics, is the church's scientific self examination of its distinctive yes. talk about God. So, Indeed, the word yeah. science is there in this kind of Bardian kind of way that is katafusan, as you as you're saying that we have to understand yeah. according yeah. to the nature of what it is that we're studying. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So the uh, I'm I'm doing a series for Zondervan on Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics based on my Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics for Everyone. Volume one, chapter one, is Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics in one word, which is Jesus. And to say, this is the starting point of a scientist. The scientist must clearly define, as Barth does, that which is the object of their study and to recognize there are other things that would get in the way. But we are being most scientific when we see the Church Dogmatics as Karl Barth lays it out there in the person of Jesus. That is true science. Not just humanity, not just a general term for God, but this one particular, and it's the particularity of the realism that you're talking about. And I yeah. think that's what, where evangelical theology in the United States so often gets sidetracked by a kind of distrusting science because it doesn't, they don't think that it deals with a particularity of their lives it's just it's something about somebody else's truth about things that they're not interested in and yeah. there's a general sense that science 
kind of tries to replace faith. So there's a competition that's set up there. Instead of recognizing science is faith. Which yeah. my dad was a scientist who left the church. And he was very upset when I, in the a book that I wrote, I said, my dad converted out of Christianity and empiricism became his faith. That yeah. I would use the word faith for that was very upsetting to him. But the question back is, well, do you believe it or not? Yeah. Do you believe yeah. in what it is that you're following? Yeah, yeah. And so sure. the nature of evangelicals to say, T.F. Torrance really wants us to be scientific in our thinking that we really believe in the reality of that which we engage and that God has given himself to be engaged in the person of Jesus and that we need to hold both the church and theologians as well as scientists accountable, as you've said, to the reality of things. And so evangelicals need to be challenged in a sense by what 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 it the way that we think in a way that isn't as serious about our faith even as we should be and not as aware of the reality seeking dimension of what science might be my dad came to one no. thing in my life to listen to listen to me talk and it was looking at dawkins and what he what he was doing and i started off saying the nature of theology and the nature of, nature of dawkins is we both claim to be seeking the truth if we can just keep to that then we can be in a conversation about you know what is the truth but if we give up on that then we've lost. And he actually, he took that as a point that was worthy of considering. So even for a non-Christian to, to clarify that point that you're making is really important. I think there are two things in response to what you've just said. I think the first thing is that um, I'm not fond of conferences or even great organizations that speak about um, science and faith. Because faith informs science and faith informs theology. It's it's mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bad dichotomy. Yeah. And one of that. And the second thing I would say is, you know, for the uh, kind of for, for for Christians with no desire to know about science, I think it's sinful actually not to be curious. Mm. Curiosity is a fundamental characteristic, I think of a human image bearer. Um, and uh, yeah, so encouraging curiosity. We tend to kill curiosity, curiosity in, our, in our kids very yes. young. And uh, to encourage that curiosity would really be a good thing. Yeah. Mark, how much think, do we have? May I just- We, have, uh, we usually go, we go till, you know, at least 2.30 and often till three. So are you needing I to see. end okay. at a particular time or? I was just concerned about I just concerned about my other presentation, so yeah, that's we're fine. Gonna, we're going to get you in. I think Young Il, did you have a question? I just had a comment regarding when you talked about conflict as one of the, you know, aspects of science and uh, theology. To me, it seems like actually conflict is actually a positive thing because even in science itself major developments happen because of anomalies that we cannot explain, right? And quantum mechanics and the conflict between particle view and wave view of matter and stuff like that. So it forces us to expand our understanding and increase our, you know, the framework, et cetera. And so to me, the conflict between science and theology is actually a, an, a, a catalyst for deepening our understanding rather than rejecting it, which I think is what happens with conservative Christians maybe, mm -hmm. is that they yeah. fear the conflict will undermine their theology that if science brings up something. Whereas to me, like the doctrine of the Trinity is like the ultimate you know, inconsistencies. It's like a paradox that we wrestle with for thousand, 2000 years, right? It expands our understanding because it doesn't see it is easy explanation, and yeah. so to me, I, science has always been in the 20th century has seen that, and we there's still inconsistency between relativity and quantum mechanics, and yet we don't reject either of them. Yeah, we just look for a larger theory that'll encompass both. Mm. So, Young Il, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Um, I think the difficulty is. When we say when we use conflict model as one of the four models, 
the conflict model assumes that there is no conversation. Mm. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't mean that there isn't conflict as we try to resolve them that can be productive, as you're saying. It's it's a model that says, the scientist who says, I don't want to talk to you about religion um, because we have nothing in common. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's the atheist, atheistic kind of evolutionism of Dawkins. Uh, don't even talk to me because there's nothing to talk about. We are on different epistemological grounding. So, um, and even the second one, uh, which is which is interesting, the second one at least, um, he was the great scientist who was a uh, non-overlapping magisteria, Jay Gould. Jay Gould says, I respect that you have your discipline over here, and this is my discipline over here, and but they are circles that never overlap. Mm. Um and that's good because it avoids conflict. Um, I'm over here in my scientific world. You're over there as a pastor in your church. And I respect that. You know, kind of, it's a very, it's kind of a very postmodern, kind of very Canadian, actually. You know, let, let's all agree with one another. Um, but the truth is, it also does not permit discussion. It doesn't allow us to move to integration. So I absolutely hear what you're saying. In the process of moving to integration, yes, there's lots of conflict in our minds. There are things that we have to try to put together, and that can be very constructive. That you, you make a really good point there. Um, but my goal, um, kind of reflecting Tom Torrance's goal in both the book Echoes of Coherence and in this chapter, was to move beyond even saying because integration for me isn't far enough. It's uh, how should we put both under the one um, heading of Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, that's that's what really has motivated this, this conversation. Um, it is, um, and, and I think the word coherence is miraculous. It's a wonderful word that, yeah. that says they are not the same. So we agree with Jay Gould, they're not the same, but we are saying they can talk to each other, which is the third model, integration, and I would argue we don't just talk to each other, we talk to each other because there is a deep mutuality between science and theology based on what? The Christ who created creation and the Christ who's the center of divine revelation revealing to us the Trinity. So those are, um, that's kind of the goal behind all of this. And the opportunity for us to reflect on that. This is the priest creation thing that we have been given the opportunity to be those who reflect on the nature of Christ as the one who is Lord of his creation and to be those who care for one another and the creation in the context of which we, of which we live and work together. We share one world. We are persons. The last sentence in the, on the handout there, faith becomes science when approached a posteriori. In other words, we both have a reality that we're looking at. Reality informs thinking and thinking becomes confident in the form of both faith and science. The confidence, thus Nubian's proper confidence, there is a proper confidence that both science and faith, as as we use those terms, both are giving us to fulfill our humanity as those created by God to live in this world and to engage God and one another in appropriate ways. A posteriori. Um, would you say, Ross, that there is a coherence between different disciplines like chemistry and physics? or yeah. phys biology and chemistry, that they, they in a sense, they're explaining the whole world, but their type of explanation is different. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, uh, I think it was that Jim Neidhart I was quoting from uh, uh, earlier who said, all of science, the big discipline, is a multiplicity of coherences of mm. each of the sciences. Um, each can inform the other. But it gives a good illustration, actually, of how each is not the other, too. You know, mm -hmm. I I can go into, I'm not going to go into the lab of a quantum physicist and tell them what to do, because uh, I'm just a lowly chemist. Um, and and so, you know, there is there is that sense in which there, 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 it seems to me there may even be a coherence of that that relates to levels. I don't know if, if I quite got that together, but so for example, I think the most fundamental science is physics. 
quantum physics. It deals with the, the submolecular, sub subatomic. Then you come to quantum chemistry, then all the chemistries, chemistry informs, I mean, biology, I, I hate to inform my biologist friends is basically macrochemistry, you know, <laughs> and, and you go all the way. Um, and then you get psychology becomes much more complicated. It's really, I think, a combination of a science and an art. Um, but the point is they all need to listen to one another, even though they are not the other. Just as the divine and human natures of Christ, each is in the other, but each is not the other. Um, and so I think that is that is uh, the reason why I think coherence is a really helpful term. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Alistair McGrath has got something somewhere on this topic of of all of the sciences together. So uh, yeah, I hear I see a question from yeah from Dwayne, the other Canadian. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, Kerry Magruder, he gave a really good presentation. He's got his notes up on his uh, website there. He he understood Tom saying that it, it's a level like you're saying, and it's like the, the order from above tells you the meaning below, and that's how we get to the point where the mediation of Christ as the man interprets everything and exercises the meaning downward, but he also opens up as he reveals to us everything that is beyond and above, eh? both above and beyond. Through, through his mediation it's, it, it's really interesting stuff because he talk he, he uses an example of, of the geologist looking at the rocks and he's laying a strata or whatever like that it, it's really interesting because you know and uh, that's how we we can know all things because i i put that colossians text up there that he you know one of the greatest mysteries how does he hold all things together <laughs> I just, you know that's the greatest understanding of all time because the, yeah. the, open, the openness and contingency of creation and then and then God allows you to determine whatever phenomenological mode of operation you want to take. And yet the, the understanding of God's freedom to allow the creation to be what it is. Like we, we serve an awesome God and there's no threat to his being. <laughs> like he, he knows yeah. everything. It's amazing. Contingency yeah. is such a key and important part of this whole discussion. Yeah. The fact that God, God did not need to create. He wasn't lonely. Um, the three persons have been in perfect communion for all eternity. He wasn't lonely. Um, he created out of his will, as Athanasius says, not out of his being. Um, and as such has created a contingent creation um, rather than a fatalistic one. Um, it's there with intention. De deterministic one. And yet, of course, his providential intention moves it in a particular direction yeah but um yeah good well, i'm going to switch you over then to your book now ross yeah so this is a bit of a change of pace introduce introduce the what's that yeah this is a bit of a change of pace yeah well it's life is full of change of paces when you're a scientist right i mean it's <laughs> yeah i will uh, let me just get my powerpoint up yes So just give us a little background on as to why you wrote this book. Yeah. So let me take you back. I'm a first year student of zoology at the University of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Um, I have a professor who is a world recognized scientist in the area of tsetse fly management. And he asked us to write an essay on the origin of life. I am at that point a six day creationist. I've never heard of Biologos at that point, um, or Tom Torrance, for that matter. And so I write him this essay in which I try to show the improbability of the first cell arising in the primeval soup, uh, apart from the work of God. Um, he gave me an A and told me, Ross, I disagree with everything you said in this essay, but you say it very well. That is the background that 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 was in my head for a long time. Wow. Um, and I kept on having people tell me, Ross, you are the ideal person to write on chemical evolution and divine providence because you have two PhDs and you have written, you've you 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 know chemistry, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I put it off for a long time. And um I gotta tell you, writing this book has been the hardest, the hardest book I've written because. I'm always conscious that evolution and chemical evolution is a lightning rod in the evangelical world. Yep. 
Um, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get it in the neck from some people who are surprised that I think that God created by means of evolution, including the first cell. Mm -hmm. um, and so about two years ago, I was in Cambridge and I, I decided to look up a scientist in this area. And he came, uh, we went for a walk. Um, and within five minutes, he told me he was an evangelical Christian. So a world expert, a world expert on chemical evolution, who What's is a name? Christian, uh, Paul Rimmer. Okay. So Paul, uh, and, and the other thing he told me, he had spent his last five years doing a postdoc up at St. Andrews and had met Tom Wright, had met Alan Torrance, had met all of the players at St. Andrews and become theologically uh, quite astute. Hmm. So what a great conversation partner. By the time I was finished with him, he sent me all of his papers that he'd worked on very unselfishly. And then I met another scientist at Oxford who did who did the same thing for me. And I began to have confidence that I know what I'm talking about on the chemistry side and began to look for a theology of providence that is in keeping with uh, what seems to have happened as far as we can determine what seems to have has happened uh, for the first life to begin to exist. Hmm. So um, that's a little and bit of background. Who's your intended reader? The intended reader is um, smart scientists and theologians. Okay, not so pastors? People, and pastors, yeah. I'm hoping pastors. that pastors would uh, be able to, to read this as well. Right. So, so um, you deal just with the beginning point, the question of the development of DNA and all that. Is that also yeah, included? Very first part of this. I do not move from actually from the DNA even to, say, mitochondria. Um, I deal only with the very basic chemicals that are assumed to have been either in the ocean or in deep water that, that gave rise to the first life. Um, so I've, 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 I've kind of deliberately marked that off because the subject is big. And once you get to, once you move from proteins and up or lipids and up, I'm happy to go as far as how we might have got lipids, how we might have got a nucleic acids and how we might have got proteins, but I'm not moving further than that Yeah. in the book. So, so John Lennox makes much of the idea that DNA is an information system, and there's no way to explain that outside of God really creating that information system. Is that, I mean, is that included within the scope of what you do? But why would uh, he just create that one ex nihilo? Why do, how does it not happen through the other, the natural processes of evolution? I'm not right. quite on the same page as he is. So Okay, yeah. you understand his argument, though. Yeah, I do. He's, he's just a mathematician, so they must be somewhere below... Yeah, I, I mean, no, I think mathematicians are absolutely the top. <laughs> they are the most brilliant of all. Really? They, and they serve every discipline. You can't do any discipline without knowing math. Huh. Anyway, let me move on here. Okay. You um, move on. The most surprising thing about all of this is that it is thought that hydrogen cyanide is the key molecule. That's very counterintuitive for us because we know cyanide is poisonous. Um, but in reaction with other things, it leads to the formation of of these um, of amino acids, and then amino acids to uh, proteins, and ultimately to RNA. Um, so this is, yeah. Um, I'm not going to go through all the slides here. Uh, it, it, one of the interesting things about my, this topic is it's not just looking at what elements and compounds might have been present in the water or in, um, you know, or on the earth? It's how did they get there? And it's, we're pretty certain, for example, that carbon got to earth by means of the explosion that went on, explosions that went on in stars. Um, and the same with these other molecule, uh, elements molecules. I came across this book by William De Silva on the natural selection of the chemical elements themselves and how it is that we have all the ele elements available that will ultimately go into the first cell. It's quite remarkable. It's another example, I think, of um, how 
one cannot look at these things, in my opinion, without invoking God. Um, it's not just chance. It's it's the chances are too great that this would happen on their own. Yeah. And so you begin with with Earth specifically. You you had the Big yeah. Bang at the top of your yeah, slide. Yeah. But your yeah. book is dealing with how did this happen on Earth? No, it, it does. It, there is a chapter on how the elements on Earth got here by way of the Big Bang and, and so okay. on. How the Earth, how the cosmos is cooling and, and how these things have have come from other stars and uh, so on. Um, so one of, chemical one of the 12 that T.F. Torrance edited um, in the series Theology and Science, the Frontiers of Knowledge, dealt, it had several chapters on that, starting with the beginning of the universe and the whole development. Right. I can't remember which one it is, but... Now, that's not the major point of my book, but I, I have to mention yep. some of it in order for it to make sense. Good. Um, so, yeah. So the emphasis is on how to how do prebiotic compounds, not biotic compounds themselves. That's just to make that distinction again. So, uh, biotic compounds, um, biotic compounds are lipids, which are fats, amino acids and proteins, and nucleotides like RNA. Where did this happen? There are two major, perhaps three. Um, there are actually three major opinions on where this might have happened. What were the conditions conducive to this? Some of the reactions that are that happen are uh, require a lot of heat, and so um, some have opted for underwater hydrothermal vents. Some have opt opted for water on Earth or indeed on solid state, in the solid state. And this is the most interesting to me. This is the most interesting part of the thesis of the book for me, my discovery that there is an increasing interest in how the compounds that came to Earth are actually already present in some exoplanets now. What's an exoplanet? So an exoplanet is a, are, are little planets that surround major planets. Okay. They're often invisible to the human eye, but they can be picked out by telescopes. And we can do spectroscopy on them and show what compounds are there. It's quite remarkable. Where would be the nearest exoplanet to us? Oh, I don't know. Don't know. It's not in our solar system. Mars, perhaps. Okay. Saturn, yeah, the, some of those. Yep. Um, so a significant edge was gained for the Earth origin means of the synthesis of RNA achieved by uh, John, hold on a sec, by John Sutherland in, at Cambridge. So this person I, I got to know, Paul Rimmer, is a, was a postdoc and is now an assistant professor to John Sutherland, who is the biggest name in chemical evolution and his research group in the presence of UV light. So they've actually synthesized in the lab RNA based on the, the compounds they think uh, were present in the prebiotic soup or wherever it was. And it required UV light, and that's not surprising because UV light was in abundance through the sun. This was followed up in 2015 by synthesis of nucleic acid precursors beginning counterintuitively with the small molecules of hydrogen cyanide Hydrogen sulfide, both of them toxic, and UV light applied over 10 days. So the, 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 there are three main uh, workers in the world on this topic. Uh, John Sutherland, Paul Rimmer, who I just mentioned, and Jay Forsyth, who's in the States somewhere, evangelical Christian as well. John Sutherland, I'm not sure where John Sutherland himself, who's the leader of the group, stands um, with regard to faith. But Paul Rimmer is a committed Christian. So how interesting. Is there a reason why their faith is leading him into this conversation? I don't know. That's that's a good question to ask them. I think okay. I think um, as happened with me, you find yourself being quite good at certain aspects of chemistry, and that leads you into an area. Um, and I think for Paul Rimmer, it was probably that was probably the case. And then, as he's in it, of course, he begins to ask the deeper questions. Yeah. So exoplanets are planets that orbit around other stars. They're called, uh, they, yeah, there's a, a mistake there in this slide. Exoplanets are very hard to see directly with telescopes. They're hidden by the bright glare of the stars they orbit. Some of the planets discovered by Kepler um, are rocky planets that are at, are at a very special distance from their star. 
this sweet spot is called the habitable zone where life might be possible. So it's not that they've discovered life yet, but they are uh, the, the elements of what would go into it life are, have already been discovered. There are dozens of exoplanets which exist within the liquid water habitable zones of their host areas. And in an, in an article entitled The Origin of RNA Precursors on Ex Exoplanets, Rimmer and his co-workers based on the existence of these hab habitable exoplanet zones suggest that living organisms could potentially thrive on the subset of these planets with stable atmospheres. They then ponder the possibility that life might have actually started on these planets and made its way to Earth. This is one example of a reaction scheme that leads to uh, RNA. I won't bother you with the details on that. Um, the problem this group seeks to address is the stage between amino acids, which a number of studies have, have indicated were present on prebiotic Earth, the polypeptides that form proteins. In particular, they're looking to resolve the possible mechanism by which alpha amino acids were condensed into polypeptides before the emergence of enzymes. Um, this is another uh, example of the kind of chemistry they do in the lab. In, in, some, in some ways, it's quite simple chemistry. When I was in chemistry, in organometallic chemistry, we did most of our work under completely under nitrogen, not in, not in uh, air, because air would break down the compounds you're working with. Um, and you'd work in fume hoods, very taxing work. But this is, uh, this of course has to be oxygen exposed. This is normal chemistry um, in water and exposed to air. Now, how do we put this together? Uh, as we begin to think about divine providence, um, there's quite a debate going on now between um, Christian theologians, one of whom is Tom Torrance's grandson, Andrew Torrance, who's now a professor at St. Andrews as well, in which he says, so met methodological naturalism is the idea that scientists work without invoking God. And it's actually an important dimension of science. Um, so, Let's say you're doing a reaction, a series of, of sequences of a reaction, and you can't understand the last reaction. You can't just say, well, God made it happen. Um, methodological naturalism is something that scientists work with. Um, but uh, Chris Southgate and uh, Andrew Torrance have said that's okay for Christians to do science on the basis of methodological naturalism as long as they understand that it's not ontological naturalism. Um, which, as in Chris, Chris Southgate, um, methodological naturalism may simply be equated with proper scientific inquiry. Uh, so this is, a, this is a discussion that's in my book on uh, how we view science, how we do science. Andrew Torrance has stated that naturalism, understood in this secular way, is almost never employed as a metaphysically neutral position. He says, so we're not, we're not ignorant of uh, what ontological naturalism is. But his, his alternative proposal for the Christian doing science is to contend that the Christian should adopt a theologically humble approach to the sciences instead of MN, which, with which she humbly acknowledges that special divine action is not discernible by empirical science. Um, so it's kind of a complicated discussion here, which says you have to do science as if God doesn't exist, and yet do it and knowing that he's always at work and that he's capable of special divine action uh, whenever he wants. Um, this this is kind of a via media between what I would call um, biologos versus the um, the people in Seattle. Um, I've just forgotten the name of that organization. Discovery Institute. Discovery yeah. Institute. Discovery Institute. Yeah. Um, so um, if there is special divine action, it's not discernible anyway, um, is the point. How does this relate to chemical evolution? Um, <laughs> we must go about our research as if God does not exist, uh, at the same time recognizing that um, if there was, special, and, and recognizing that if there was special divine action, it's not discernible by empirical science. So, you know, the debate has been, how does the human eye, for example, how does it evolve when it involves so many components that relate to one another? Um, 
and um, <coughs> so what hap uh, we can either invoke uh, special divine action, um, but we can never know that that's the way it happened. The trouble with invoking special divine action for any step in the evolutionary process um, is that when the science actually shows up that explains what was happening, um, then we have God of the gaps and uh, God is no longer necessary. So one has to be very careful in this regard. Isn't there a um, science of the gaps too that it, I mean, I just think of those who are doctors who say, you know, the human body is a miracle. I just yeah. work with what it does. But to say, one could say that science does science of the gaps as well, particularly with a lot of human physiology, the nature of even psychology is largely dealing with gaps rather than understanding the whole. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. In Darwinism and the Divine, McGrath speaks of his decision to reread Darwin in light of the conceptual worldview of his time, rather than reading modern assumptions back into his work. It was very apparent to McGrath that natural theology was not abandoned by Darwin. He then comments that Darwin's writings, when seen in this context, cannot be said to have abolished the notion of teleology. Not only are Darwin's writings on evolution marked by implicit and explicit teleological statements, it is clear that his approach demands not the ab abolition of teleology, but its reform and restatement. McGrath, in a word, denies that the evolutionary synthesis implies the disavowal of any form of teleology and insists that this relies on preconceived ideas about what teleology means. So I think this is where, you know, there, there are... Um, there are dysteleological evolutionists and there are teleological evolutionists. In other words, uh, I think as a Christian, one cannot be a dysteleological dysteolo evolutionist. You recognize there is a teleology. We can't always discern divine action. We must research to discover what as best we can has gone on in the past and, and goes on in the present. And... Um, and trust that there is a telos, there is an end, and that end is determined by God. So I think that's an important foundation here for us as well. Um, so divine providence, how shall we come at this topic? It's a massive topic, and I'm probably going to just stick with this slide, maybe maybe a couple of slides more with, uh, with regard to Bart. Um, I'm going to say in a nutshell that the most... Um, helpful discussion of providence that allows for creation to be itself and even to participate in its own formation has been Barthes, uh, what I've called asymmetric concursus. Um, that is, God is always at work in his creation, but he allows the creature, the freedom of the creature, to be at work as well. Electrons, so this is down to the level of electrons and molecules, to be what they are, to react according to their nature and the laws of reactivity, whilst at the same time under three things, uh, the preceding work of God, the concurring work of God, and the succeeding work of God, precursus, concursus, and succursus, the providence enacted by the Lordship of the Son and the mothering of the Spirit. As I thought about this topic a lot, and no, no biblical text has been more important to me than Genesis 1, verse 3, um, where God, by the Spirit, is spoken of as hovering. Um, the word hovering suggests all three aspects of God's providence, the fact that he works before, works during, and works after towards the telos. It also connotes the Spirit's motherly care over creation. The Hebrew word for hovered has the connotation of a mother bird brooding over her eggs to bring forth life. The Hebrew conveys a sense of expectation. Um, there can thus be no question as to doubt about the sovereignty of God in all of this. By believing in chemical evolution, I'm not casting out the sovereignty of God. Um, I am casting out fatalism, determinism, but I'm holding on to the sovereignty of God who confronts his creation with his transcendence um, in his providence. Um, yet Bart, this, this I think is a quote from TF. Yet Bart draws upon scripture and his awareness of the nature of the triune God to affirm that his lordship is not despotism 
and that the ultimate evidence of this lies in the fact that God attained his goal in the economy of reconciliation by God himself becoming a creature in his son, and in that way, by his free act of obedience and suffering, effecting the liberation of the creature. Thus, Bart confirms that God uh, no more wills to act alone in his creation than as the creator he willed to be alone or as the sustainer of the creature. He affirms that he, had, he does not will to continue alone. Alongside him, this is, I think, the most important phrase in Bart's writing on providence. Alongside God, there is a place for the creature. Alongside his activity, there is a place for that of the creature. The fatherly lordship of God and providence over creation means that he maintains its own actuality and gives it space and opportunity for its own work, for its own being in action, for its own autonomous activity. In fact, Bart even dares to assert that God, and bear in mind, Bart is the theologian of divine transcendence, who's also the theologian of immanence. He says, uh, dares to assert that God, to make the dangerous assertion, even dares to make the assertion, dangerous assertion that he cooperates with the creature, meaning that he, that as he himself works, he allows the creature uh, to work. I'm thinking there's a little T.F. Torrance right at the, at the end of this. Um, I'm good at the part stuff too. Here, he, here, he, yeah, it's okay. Here's the last. I've, I've got too much to say. It'll take all too much time. But here's, here's Bart's. Bart's. This, these are my own comments here. Bart's disciple T.F. Torrance showed much more interest in the repercussions of a concursus view with science, as already noted, an interest which Bart did not censure. Torrance largely reflects Bart in his Doctrine of Providence and provides a counter to David Ferguson's view. David Ferguson's view of Bart is that he's deterministic. Hmm. As noted, Torrance does not see providence as exercise from afar and a dualistic separation from the world, but in Jesus Christ and by the Spirit. God is personally and directly present and active in creation, even in its fallenness, not deistically abandoning it, but bearing its suffering and, quote, ruling over all things without detracting from their reality or impairing their contingent nature, freedom or order, yet in such a way that in his absolute freedom, he makes everything to serve his, abs his ultimate purpose of love and fellowship with himself. Torrance is in fact convinced that providential power and activity cannot be construed in logical, causal, or deterministic categories, but only in terms of the inexplicable power and activity of the immediate personal presence and operation of God. It is the virgin birth and resurrection of Christ that must form our categories for understanding the working of God and creation ex nihilo, so, sorry, for, work, for, for the working of God in creation. How this works out exactly is incomprehensible mystery, just as creation ex, ex nihilo is mystery, comprehensible only as far as the revelation of the activity of God in Jesus Christ. This resonates, I conclude, with the asymmetric concursus viewpoint of Karl Barth. Hmm. Right, so I'm going to stop there and take questions and comments. So you're writing for an audience of partly scientists for whom you can't bring in any theological agenda. No. Right? And yet, there, I no. mean, there is this sense, the question of agency, you've introduced the sense of agency. Yeah. yeah. Molecules don't have agency, do they? I think they do. Do they? And how would you describe that? And I was just thinking of Dawkins, the selfish gene, he it, wants to give it a kind he's of... He's just wrong on the selfish gene. Right, so yeah. distinguish that for me. Yeah, well, let me say that every, every atom um, has agency based on its electronegativity, its electron affinity. So electron affinity guides what atoms do. So they do have agency. They don't have agency the same way we do. But okay. they they respond according to the laws of their their being. Um, so why do why do why do, and, and and it's guided by energy. Why does H two O exist? Because hydrogen and oxygen on its own is at a higher energy level, and is and is less stable than hydrogen and oxygen together in a molecule. So they're guided by the ends of stability, 
and so on. So they, yes, they do have a certain agency. I think that's the that's the that's the part about this this book um, and this idea of chemical evolution is is uh, is, is of interest. Um, you know, I, I think there are a number of people, Connor Cunningham being one, who have who have who have said the selfish gene is not true. Um, that rather that genes, if you look at populations, function for the good of the population. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the selfish gene is universally held by all geneticists. Right. So the agency of the molecule in its mode of operating within its laws, there's something towards which it is directed and it moves in that direction. And by nature of that, doesn't choose things that would be destructive or something. Is that, I mean, is that a fair kind of? No, I'm sure in the process, like everything else in life, there are, there, there are things that go wrong. You know, there's yeah. a fallibility and, uh, you know, for every 10 experiments that a scientist does, nine of them don't work, you know? And I think similarly, if I could transport that into the molecular level, uh, they bump around until they find the appropriate, um, hmm. other molecule to relate to. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, there's a Catholic theologian, this is in my book on echoes of coherence, I don't think it's in this chapter, but it's, um, what was his name? He's a Catholic theologian who said, we should think about bonding in chemistry. He was a, actually a professional chemist, who was also a priest, who said chemical bonding is, if not the work of the spirit in the world is at least sacramental of that because the whole of chemistry really is about bonding hmm. and elect elect electron affinities that guide bonding and the the advantages of bonding you know all of those things are are really important and so yes, I do think there is some kind of agency yeah. in, in these molecules. I, I want to take you more on that in a minute, but Dwayne has his hand up there. So Dwayne, what's your thought? She, uh, Ross, she just reminded me of something I was thinking a long time ago. Uh, you know, God has a, 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 he's got a personal table of persons that how we bond together that we're like, you know, we have all these different personalities from, from, you know, he, he has a way of holding the whole body together where it seems like we're, all unique parts and that's true just like because no element is exactly the same but there's a correspondence between those people that are like versus those people who are dissimilar and yet he unifies it together through the whole image and likes as christ being the head and the rest of the body it, this cosmic uh you know he's looking at his dna blueprint and all of his persons are part of this whole cosmic interrelated uh, group of people that get to be image bearers absolutely um this catholic theologian i was saying of course was was drawing on the psychological model of the trinity which is not my favorite model but nevertheless interesting that the holy spirit is the bond between the father and the son and therefore the bond between the church and the the, the godhead mm -hmm. and thought of bonding within chemistry is very much analogous to that mm. well the scripture mm -hmm. i think paul uses the bond of the spirit and i think love gets yeah. in that use that same language too love is the bond yeah yeah, yeah. In the thought of John McMurray, um, particularly in the self as agent, he develops the idea that all of our choices, we either have resistance or acceptance. And so you go through the door when it's open and not when it's closed. And that in a sense, everything to which we say yes is an acceptance choice. And those things that we don't choose are resistance choices. He, he develops that thought into saying that the nature of love and fear, love are those things towards which we are, are drawn and here bond at the end of that. And fear are those things that, that resist and keep us from bonding or making the choice towards. And so the nature then to say that we as humans are primarily emotional beings, emotions are our relations. And in every moment we are either choosing yes or no. And every yes we choose, has a no in it to not choose the others and every no we choose is because there's some other yes that is there. And so the nature of the bonding pathway that is present within that and also the resistance to those things that would be destructive or not build who we are in our bondedness with others, in a sense, is it a, it's at a personal level playing out some of what I'm hearing you saying about the molecular yeah. level. Yes, of course, in some ways, it's much more sophisticated for persons. We're a very complex being made up made up of very complex chemistry. 
that is not but just. But it's all a yes or a no. I mean, this is Bart's yes and no. Yeah. All of our yeah. choices are yes and no. Yeah, absolutely. It's resisting, and perfect love casts out fear, the nature of the theological component of the yes of what it means to live within the love of God, which yeah. Torrance can talk about Hebrew culture as a people who, to whom God said yes, and that the whole of the rest of the Old Testament is them saying no to God's yes, and God keep it coming back saying yes. So there is a complexity, absolutely, but there's also a simplicity that we can't miss that is that bonding thing, which the word covenant, of course, is the word that Torrance and Bart will use of what the bond is that God creates for which we become the persons we are intended to be. And even your coherence within the Trinity or with persons, the being different and yet in the other is the yeah, language but, of that relationality yeah. of bonding. Just as there are no persons who are not persons in relation, there are no atoms that are not atoms in relation. Right. But we tend to think, I mean, we talk about atomizing something. We're using the word to say they're all separate. But you're yeah. saying, no, that's a wrong Impossible. understanding even there. The whole basis of the period, periodic table is um, grounded on the constituents of atoms and their capacity to bond. So um, I know why we use the word atomistic, but it's it's being too literalistic to assume that atoms uh, are on their own. They 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 seek to be together. You take even you know something like hydrogen. It's the simplest of all the molecules, right? It exists as H two. It doesn't exist as H unless you isolate it. Um, so you know there are what are called the rare earth, uh, the rare uh, earth molecules not rare earth the um yeah the rare ga the rare gases inert gases the noble the noble gases yeah the same as the noble gases they're they are um they also so they have they they are anomalous in the sense that they don't they don't bond very easily they don't have the capacity to bond right but generally oh, that atoms bond may so, i go ahead go okay ahead, Who's a up? couple of questions i had was uh, regarding the exoplanets and the discovery of um, prebiotic uh, chemicals there, isn't that just pushing the question to another planet? Because if it's likely there, then couldn't the Earth have had those in the past also? Or does the evidence of exoplanets having them increase the likelihood of a, you know, a biogenesis in all, you know, many places? Is that at the Yeah, I, I think probably all of the above um young i think it's you know it's, it's all of the above it is perhaps suggesting that the way we got prebiotic atoms and molecules on earth was through exoplanets mm -hmm. uh, just as we got carbon from exploding stars um, mm -hmm. or it may be saying um one of the other alternatives that you were that you were referencing it just shows the likelihood of their having been there in the early, because that, that seems more like it in terms of, you know, if if we have an exoplanet that's not too far from where we are at, it 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 it, it gained those particular molecules as a result of what was going on in the cosmos in general. So it would be quite mm -hmm. likely that they would also be present here on Earth. So I think right. it's kind of a window, it's a window in that direction, saying okay. this this is possibly how it happened. Um, and I think the discovery that HCN is quite important has come from. Um, I mean, it's, it's 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 the very essence of my book in this topic is around humility. Um, theologians need to be humble, and so do scientists. And when it comes to a topic like this, it humility is required because what the best that can be said. So let's say, well, already, um, what's his name? Uh, I forgot his name at the Cambridge, has already synthesized RNA in the lab. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that mean that that happened exactly that way in the primeval world? We don't know. So in other words, we can only probe. Um, if we find that we can make RNA and then proteins or whatever uh, from particularly from these particular starting molecules, I think it increases the likelihood that that's possibly how it happened. 
<clears throat> but we have to be humble and say we are not absolutely sure. Um, people in these fields tend to want to be very sure, but um, I'm not sure that you can be sure. I think humility is an important grace. It's an important virtue, actually, for scientists as well as for theologians. And is when humility we, simply allowing for the possibility of? I mean, is that kind of... No, I think humility is as saying, my research looks like it might be this way. Not, right, well, that's allowing it definitely for the possibility was this way because I found it out in the lab. You know, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. Um, I guess my... Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish no, your no, thought. No, no, you go ahead. Okay. I guess my next question was, I've read and discussed things with people who really like intelligent design. Yeah. And their mathematical argument of the improbability of complex life. And therefore, God must have entered in to, to create that. Yeah. So as opposed to that, I from your slides, is it correct, my understanding, that you feel that God's providence is kind of behind the scenes throughout the whole process? Yes, that's precisely In, what I'm saying. See, okay. intelligent design means that God occasionally intervenes when things get right. Really my question is, where is God the rest of the time? Uh-huh. Okay. And I think a Trinitarian, Bartian view of this would say God is always at work if it mm -hmm. was a creation, and it's not always discernible. Mm. And there's a real danger in the intelligent design movement, I think, which says um, if God must be invoked for this particular part, and there, there, there are various pieces in the theory of evolution that, that, are, that are highlighted, if God must be invoked, what happens when science shows that that is not the case? Mm -hmm. Then they've got the God of the gaps. That's that's the biggest right. challenge. Now, right. I, Having said that, I want to be really humble <laughs> and, 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 and say, I respect my intelligent design brothers and sisters. Um, and I've heard them speak, and some of them are super intelligent. It's not. And I, I was actually, I was invited to speak at a conference in, in um, uh, so somewhere in Texas, where all four of the major viewpoints were re represented. So there was Kenneth Ham was supposed to be there, intelligent design. Um, the other guy who is uh, thinks that Genesis one is. I just uh, we need to read time into it. Um, Ross. Oh. Um, oh, is that is that Macintosh there? Ross Macintosh, I think no, his name no, is no, the no, Torrance no. friend. No. Hugh Ross. Hugh, Hugh Ross. Ross. Hugh Ross. Yeah, that's it. Hugh Ross, and then fourthly, Biologos. And my, jo my job was to speak to the, all these people from all of these different points of view and urge them towards unity. And my primary text was Ephesians 4, where Paul urges unity based on the essentials of the faith. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That little creed, mini creed that Paul has. Now, folks, do you all agree with that creed? Yes, you do. Can you all agree that God created and disagree maturely on how he may have created? Right. So um, I, I want to say with, with not affected humility, but with real humility, I'm on the side of biologos. I think God created by means of evolution. Science, um, yeah, that's, that's a highly scientific um, proposal. I've got no reason to not accept it. I also don't find in Genesis any contradiction of that whatsoever. Um, one needs to see Genesis 1 as a poem celebrating the greatness of God's creation. It was never intended to be a scientific textbook. Um, and so there's all kinds of freedom within that to realize that God created in ways that are according to his providence. And uh, he is in charge. He is sovereign. There's a telos. God knows what he's doing. But alongside him, there is a creature, a molecule, a human. And God somehow allows the activity of those creatures to be working in tandem. And, it's, and I, I use the word asymmetric because really 
God is overall blessed forever. He's the one who's working. We have a role, but it's a role within his role. It's a participation in his role, if you like. So yeah, there we have, there we have it. If you have a broad definition of science, you could say the nature of katafusen also means the methodology of studying something needs to be appropriate to what is studied. And scripture is the scientific methodology appropriate to the revealing of the immortal God so that we can understand that God, but not reduce it to these other kinds of scientific tools in the same way you don't use a microscope to study the stars. Yeah. Right? You choose the tools that are appropriate to it. So the nature of scripture, the nature of community that comes, reflects, yeah. seeks the truth, curiosity, which Einstein said, I'm not a genius. I just am I'm insatiably curious. That's a yeah. Einstein quote that I love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to qualify the nature of appropriate tools for the tasks um, for which we are attempting to engage. Yeah. I wasn't sure if anybody else had a question or a comment. Does anyone else have a question? I'll keep them coming if you don't. I could, yes, I, I could keep going, but um, well, go I guess the... Uh, sure. I mean, I guess the tension is how do you maintain the integrity of a scientific field at the same time, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, accepting the providence of God in sustaining all of reality? And so where does miracles come in yeah. and where does science come in? And, you know, it's like if you have too strong a view of providence, then it's kind of like, well, God can do anything, anytime. And therefore, what's the point of doing science? But, uh, you know, I guess that's the tension I feel. See, it's, the, it's yeah. the view. It's, that's why I, I really think Bart's view of providence is so, um, it's, it's not either or. God is mm -hmm. at work and the scientists at work. God is at work and the molecules at work. I don't know how to put those two together. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is mystery, but I okay. accept what the, the biblical data would seem to point in that direction and make theological sense that there is an asymmetric concursus, God is at work, and I am at work. I mean, the one text that helps us understand is, is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. Okay, who's at work? Is it God or is it me? Answer is both. Mm -hmm. He's at work and I'm at work. But notice, it's because he is at work in me that I am at work. That's the asymmetric part. God is still sovereign. God is in providence. But uh, it, we don't become passive. We don't become passive. Mm -hmm. In the pursuit of sanctification, we do not become passive. We work out our salvation actively without trying to understand why, how it is that what God does and what, what you know, we, we, I don't think we'll ever understand that. How is it that God's at work and I'm at work? Um, well, first of all, we need to understand it's a non-competitive mm -hmm. union. A non-competitive union. I think that's really helpful to say that we're not competing. Um, and God will do what God will do, but he will do it through and in molecules and scientists and pastors and theologians and people in business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Young, do you have a science background? Yes, I studied, uh, well, sort of. I mean, I went to a technical school, Caltech, so I had to go through all the science, but I oh, majored yeah. in math and then computer science later. Oh, I'm so yeah. glad I said math's number one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I say yeah. that because... I did I did chemistry in my undergrad and all the way till fourth year and then did a PhD, but I only went as far as first year in math. I just couldn't do any more after that. I, I hit my I rose to the level of my incompetence, <laughs> and that's where where it landed. But um, it's it's lovely to, yeah. Caltech is a very um, well well respected institution. But thanks for your questions. I was just writing today short summaries of CD3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 4, um, using mm. an image of the, the 3, 1 to say God is the ultimate event planner. He doesn't just go look for a venue. He actually creates the whole venue within which 
the event of all history is. And 3D2 is God is the ultimate event organizer, provides all the organization and the order for the event of history to play out the way that it should with its own freedom. CD3, God is the ultimate event patron. He provides the resources, the material, doesn't interfere, but makes sure that that which is the event of his history has space to be all that it needs to be as a patron and is involved in such a way as to make sure they sustain. Three, four, God is the ultimate event host, present to and with, making sure that all of those who are part of the event are what they are in the fullest way to live out within the love that he has for the bonding, the interfacing, the interconnecting of all that might be there. So I use that as an image of a summary of the four volumes of three, four, the three of all three, one, two, three, four. And it kind of echoes what I hear you saying. Yeah. There, backdrop, and yet involved in, a, in quite profound ways, but not getting in the way, but giving the freedom to be. Yes. Well, it's been great, Marty. It I has appreciate been great. It has been great. Good time the, with uh, you. The question, when I went to the science and theology um, conference there at Regent years ago, um, the, I asked one of one of the speakers who was there, you know, can we have the study of persons be called science? Um, he, was, he was one of the major speakers. I can't remember his name, but he said no. He had oh. just a clear, science can never study the nature of persons as persons which is contrary to what Torrance would say, certainly, that the very nature of what it means to be theological scientists, and of course his great book, Theological Science, which we're going to be doing in a reading group starting in the fall, Theological Science, in a sense demands that we, that as scientists, we would say, yes, but we have to do it appropriately to the nature of what's there. So what would you say to that? I disagree with the speaker strongly. I think persons, if you, if you say that of persons, then you can't say that of God either. And yet, what we're hearing from Tom Torrance, and I agree with this, we're not talking about science as a, an oppressive narrative over everything, but scientia, yeah. as in yeah. an area of knowledge according to the subject, according to the object, I should say. Yeah. And therefore, persons must be studied in that way. Um, one of our present uh, theologians at Regent is Jens Zimmermann. Jens is constantly writing on personhood. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he's probably even nervous about being being it called a science because he comes from a different perspective but he's a bonhoeffer he's bonafarian so i'm sure he i'm sure he's okay with it but yeah yeah so yeah. there you go yeah it's an area that i'm working on developing the science of the personal the other question was at that conference too out of that conference i wrote the article for crux on the two books metaphor a critique and a caution and the oh, yeah. caution is just not to collapse the, the book of nature as a primary mode, which becomes natural theology, that there, there yeah. is always a precedent. You can't hold them as two books equally in your hands. And so how, how one sustains the value of what the metaphor may bring, but also recognize everybody's looking for a natural theology argument, <laughs> you know, to get something, to, to finally have that missing piece, to be able to have something provable, um humanly wise or something like that so what do, what do you think what do you say to that so i think when bonaventure first talked if i'm right bonaventure was the first person to talk about these two books he already had a sense of the asymmetry mm. book of god the, the bible scriptures the revelation of god and jesus christ is at a higher level uh is is uh must be our ultimate source of authority in all matters yeah and that's why Torrance qualifies natural theology to be under revealed theology of that kind. So that's what I think about. It. Yeah. And we live in a part of the world where people love to worship nature, don't they? Yeah, of so course. Beauty yeah. here. Oh yeah. <laughs> they love to worship <laughs> nature. They love to worship nature while they're chewing on gummies. <laughs> they're they make them, yeah, particularly attuned. Dwayne, you have your hand up there. You're, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, I noticed that there pops okay. up. I'm just reflecting back. One of my trends, uh, he, he was he was looking at the science and faith dialogue, John McKenna. 
he was working on this this thinking together providence uh presence and prophecy because it, it's it's providence and presence of god all through time space as well as god moving to its intended theological order and he was he was working on um on, on a, a dialogue as a logos that determines all the meaning of things like he spent a lot of time he, he actually was taught by john wheeler over at uh, princeton and he became a good friend of of uh thomas is there and and he inspired me to write on john philopinus and the, the whole uh the art the arbiter and the, the impetus light theory and stuff like that because there's lots of language for us that we need to rediscover as theologians even for us to understand we've been before we can really address the scientist appropriately because they've got that special knowledge and they're gifting but we, we we've got to work on the barrier trying to you know make an interdialogue an interdialogue so we can both understand where we're coming from communication is important it's interesting that tom torrance relied on philip on us quite a bit yeah that he because my friend john he totally switches he was he was his his he originally did his Old Testament, and he it was that was his area, and he became really good friends. And uh, he, Tom, when he was coming on his his lectures in 981 there, and he at Fuller, like he totally changed his theological orientation, and he did all he had traded the Syriac and <laughs> with the Arbiter and stuff like that. And he helped do some research there because uh, you know most people don't realize Tom was the one who actually helped get the anathema removed and. And John was very much, you know, working on this light theory and stuff like that. And he, he had a very unique background. Like Tom wanted him to go study at the uh, Theological Center of Inquiry there after meeting with 81. But because, you know, he, he didn't fit in necessarily with the, with the, <laughs> the common professor at that time, you know. But it's, you know, it, it's amazing how this this question, you know, it, it probes people's different minds wherever they come from because we're all we're all uh, priests of pre uh, uh, our priests or priests of creation try to understand the meaning of everything and, and bring it to a God, God's intended glory. Do you know John McKenna? Are you familiar with that name? Do you know John McKenna? Me? No, I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a, he was a bit of, he was a bit he, he came out of the, the Jesus movement out of Southern California and stuff like that and. You know, he, he sort of, you know, was troubled by the world, but he's just a brilliant man, and and he, but he, he uh, did a lot of the work of science. Yeah, a lot of good work. Yeah. He, he's he's even right in step with you. Yeah, very good. Well, Ross, thank you so much for showing up today for all the hard work you've done, and you will continue to produce things. And hopefully, out of today, there will be inspiration for more things to come. I love it when seeds are planted in conversations and people are encouraged to explore new things, but um, you always Thanks give us much me. to chew on and we'll look forward to that book coming out. If you let us know when it comes out, we'll post it on the, the Facebook yeah, site sure. so that we can get people out there and maybe have all, you back. All of my time right now is occupied with writing a book on the Ascension. So um, yeah, awesome. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to finish <laughs> at the end of July, but we'll see. Well, thank you once again. I do Very appreciate good. it. Nice well, to meet many you. Many blessings all. on you, and thank you everyone else thank for you. showing up and for making this a great conversation. So, blessings on you all, and I hope you have sun like we do here in the Great Pacific Northwest. You can go out and enjoy. So, take care. Blessings. <laughs>